paper was given at Torino at a post-foundations workshop. Post-foundations. And so you see some of the themes here, in particular this one, fragmentation. And the main argument, as you'll see, is that economics at the center is undergoing fragmentation. And why? Because of a production, social production process that I characterize as specialization. So that's the main part of the paper. And then I will talk about implications for pluralism. And I talk about pluralism both in a descriptive sense and a normative sense. Descriptive sense is the state of diversity, indifference, which I think is important to the themes of this workshop. So I'll, I'll first talk about this connection right here. And I refer to this as the Tregini Fontana thesis. Maybe it's a bit dramatic. But the two people at Torino who published a paper in Cambridge Journal of Economics essentially argued that specialization is fragmenting economics. And we've had something of a de debate between us because we share a concern with the difference between dominance and pluralism in economics. And so I previously argued that there is in the history of economics something of a cycle where in some periods you have dominant research programs followed by periods of competition, return of dominance, followed by competition and cycle theory. And they argued against me that rather what's happening is a secular long-term trend of increasing pluralism in the descriptive sense or increasing fragmentation of economic thinking. So specialization, uh, producing a fragmented economics increasingly organized around niche-based science, declining role for dominant research programs. So I will try to provide some evidence for this by talking about recent uh, research on the professional character of economics. And I'll refer to uh, work done on the GAL code, its revisions over time, an article that's just come out uh, by Beatrice Cherrier in uh, Journal of Economic Literature. And then I'll talk a little bit about, as you can see, the Clark Award given for the most uh, promising young economists. And then the body of the paper is that I try and make some arguments, theoretical arguments about specialization producing fragmentation. And my argument is form formulated in this way. I talk about centrifugal forces, things that fragment economics. And I ask, is there centripetal forces, centralizing forces that might produce dominant research programs acting against these? So that's the way I formulate the argument. In other presentations at this Torino workshop, people did some bibliometric work. That is, they looked at evidence regarding publication patterns, and they tried to also uh, argue about whether or not fragmentation was increasingly characteristic of economics. And that bibliometric research, its outcomes, I think at this point, are unclear. But it's a different methodology than trying to argue in these terms. And then I will talk about pluralism, and I will contrast two conceptions of the relationship between disciplines. So if you think about the JEO code, A12 is economics relation to other disciplines. It's a research area. And what kind of conception of disciplinarity might one work with? So I contrast these two, and I'll argue that pluralism is better defended from this perspective than this one right here. OK, so I'm very quick here about this research. Uh, essentially, what she shows through multiple revisions of the J.O. code over time, where she examines the motivations, the, the texts, the arguments about how the code should be expanded, how a new category should be introduced, is that there's nothing there about deepening or broadening dominant economic thinking. So this is the history as reflected in the taxonomy. And what is it that drives the revisions? These things, new fields new techniques, new methods. 
her argument. You have to read it yourself to see what you think. Okay, so I claim this is evidence of a centrifugal set of forces operating in economics, producing a greater diversity, greater differentiation, and with the decline of dominant perspectives, dominant approaches, fragmentation economics. So these are arguments that you might attempt to advance against this thesis, the fragmentation thesis. And I won't talk in great detail about these, but I will identify them for you. So many heterodox people argue that it's all still mainstream economics. It's all still neoclassical economics. I was in a, a session last January where I saw people repeatedly, heterodox people repeatedly say, it's all just neoclassical economics. So I think that this is not good history to make this argument because if you look at many of the new developments in economics, anything from behavioral to game theory to complexity theory to neuroeconomics, there's just so much going on there that doesn't fit nicely in the neoclassical framework. Yes, overlap, shared ideas, but the reductionist argument uh, I think is false. Uh, if you're not in the JEO code, is that a centripetal force, a unifying force for economics? If underrepresentation uh, is a problem, and it's a difficult thing to demonstrate, by the way, should there be more post-Keynesian economics, more political economy in the JL code than there is? Well, you might argue that there is some underrepresentation shows a unifying force in economics. But I think if you look at what might be underrepresented in economics, you'll find that there's great differentiation and specialization ongoing in these areas as well. So economics, even if it's not properly fully represented by the GAO code, seems to be undergoing some set of processes that I label specialization. Okay, this is a more complicated argument. You might say a centripetal unifying force in economics is the very elaboration of a systematic taxonomy, in particular this type right here. So, as you all know, a genus species taxonomy, uh, the new species must go under the genus. And in the animal kingdom, this works pretty well. There is one animal that I know of that comes from two different major categories, genuses, the mule, the horse and the donkey produce the mule, does not reproduce itself. It's a dead end. So, the genus species system works quite well. The question is if the GAO code is meant to be a systematic representation in this format of our uh, domain, does it indeed grow and evolve in this manner? But I think what you find is there's many mules and they are self-reproducing in economics. That is, there's many approaches that come from multiple foundations. So we have, may I say, a more promiscuous development of new species. They do not respect the Darwinian pillar, the lineal uh, inheritance that goes in a way that respects the supercategories. We find cross-borrowing that produces new approaches. So my point is, is that if you look at the history of economics and its evolution, then it's not the systematic form that the JEL has, uh, and that really we have something in this taxonomy of uh, misrepresentation of the development of ideas in economics. So I'll kind of come back to this argument another connection in a moment. So it's a fairly simple argument here. Uh, we look at what Roger and Beatrice have done and others uh, regarding why they are giving the Clark Award to various promising young scholars. Uh, it's all about applied economics. It's, or sometimes people say empirical economics. Uh, I think applied is a, is a better term. And the thing about applied work is that it doesn't need to respect its theoretical foundations. So theory falls into the background. What gets you credit, what measures your success is the application. And if the theory is in the far background, then the theory decreases in importance. 
So a fragmentation argument based on the evidence of the Clark Award. So if we had in economics identified in a conceptual way, especially as in Robin's famous allocation of scarce resources uh, view, then if we're doing applied economics, if that is really what's going on in our field, then really what constitutes our unity in economics is not a unity. It's the tools, the methods. They don't have any special tools and methods, techniques. They don't have any special allegiance to the content of economics. So the discipline is losing its identity as a distinct discipline. So I could uh, ask again, are there counteracting forces, centripetal forces? Uh, maybe a uh, similar argument I just gave. This more applied economics is still ultimately neoclassical, just applied neoclassical economics. But I think if you do the, uh, the hard work, the groundwork of evaluating the contributions that are increasingly appearing in our leading journals, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff in this applied work that isn't necessarily neoclassical. So dominant paradigm losing its hold. So now I do some theoretical work. So this is the history of economics part especially. Where does this specialization idea come from? It's a division of labor, the pin factory story from Adam Smith. And I make a couple of points here. We know that Smith thought increasing division of labor was very hard on manual labor, the highly repetitive in Marx's term, alienating character of that sort of labor. So that's an interesting point. And we might ask ourselves, if we're scientific workers, are we suffering the same alienation that the manual workers suffer? As we increasingly specialize and narrow, as the manual workers do, their scope of activity in life. The question is, is this a process that is deep in the nature of the capitalist market system, or is it just a, a historical phase? So Smith's uh, argument was the division of labor advances according to the extent of the market. And since, as a matter of fact, the extent of the market has only increased since Smith's time, we might think that division of labor is a self-reinforcing process. But he doesn't make that argument. So Thomas Kuhn, famous for paradigms and their failure and replacement. But in his later work, he changes his argument. So how does Kuhn's uh, scientific revolution story work? He basically says the anomalies within a paradigm accumulate, and so suddenly people say, ah, let's forget the whole paradigm. Let's change paradigms. It's a tipping point argument. But tipping point arguments are notoriously fragile because you can't quite tell when you tip over the edge. And so really, in his later work, he pretty much says, no, there is no tipping point. Specialization continues on the anomalies. They become uh, a end in themselves. And researchers, as they specialize, uh, find that kind of work sufficient. There's no problem with some distant relation of that anomaly to the paradigm. And there's an evidence here, obviously, uh, of increasing distance between the focus of research in some niche and the uh, framework from which it arises. And lastly, let's do some behavioral work. So let's ask ourselves about the scientists. And this goes to a, an article really quite a number of years back by Ronald Heiner. And he looks at the question of specialization. And he looks at it in terms of the increasing uh, accumulation of theory, evidence, knowledge, and so forth. So we were talking at lunch about the economists who post-war, immediate post-war, might still pretend or say that they knew something about everything. But those people don't exist anymore. The burden of knowledge exceeds the capacity of even the most brilliant economists today to be knowledgeable. And so how behaviorally do people handle the story? They deal with this problem right here, confidence difficulty gap. And the rational choice that you make is specialize where you have competence so that you're not, uh, well, maybe putting your career in jeopardy. 
When I was in graduate school, I could go to any seminar, trade, labor, or whatever, in the period of neoclassical dominance, and I could understand everything, well, at least basically. Now I talk to people in PhD programs, and they say, oh, I can go to these seminars, but I have no idea what they're doing over here, because there's just too much out there to master. So if Smith doesn't know what the nature of this process is, division of labor uh, generating increasing specialization, Heiner behaviorally says it's self-reinforcing. Okay, but how fast? Here's a little different type of argument. I want to talk about specialization producing fragmentation. I want to talk about the rate of specialization in terms of technological change uh, and make an argument that fragmentation is an uh, inevitable outcome of this uh, process. Okay, so I go back to the 1960s. Uh, there was an innovation diffusion cycle analysis by Rogers. The, references are in my um, paper, uh, later formalized by Bass, the uh, use of uh, uh, differential equations. Uh, sometimes we talk about Bass curves. But the, the way the argument essentially goes for Rogers is that when you look at an innovation of any kind, so I'm talking about science and economics in particular, how does a innovation diffusion cycle work. Uh, as the, you have the early adopters, there's a rise in the number of people using the new ideas. It reaches some sort of maximum, and then if the population is given, there's a decline in remaining adopters. So it goes like the diffusion cycle, I should go this way, goes like this for an individual, individual innovation. So as the population moves universally to the new ideas, you have standardization. It ceases to be an innovation. Centripetal force against my argument. <coughs> if we look at standard theory of innovation diffusion, the cycle theory that many people still uh, employ, then it should say something, if we're looking at the rate of change over time, we put the rate of change into a single period analysis with a cycle, we should have something that works against what I'm suggesting. But what Rogers does is he ignores this, the overlapping character of innovations and the effect on any ind individual innovation cycle. So one thing you see in the business world right now that is relevant to the rate of investment is firms say, we can't adopt these new technologies because they'll be obsolete very shortly. So you might argue there's a, a depressing effect on investment of uh, the rate of technological change. This is the interdependence effects. And then what is the overall rate of innovation? So here I go to Brian Arthur, who has written on the history of technology change extensively. And I come back to the nature of the evolutionary theory that's involved. And so if you have an innovation, what's its genus species story, quote unquote? Is it uh, a breakthrough in technology comes from a well-identified set of previous breakthroughs, a nice Darwinian inheritance pillar? Well, Arthur says close reading of the history of technology change tells us not at all. So he talks about fighter aircraft, jet aircraft, and he talks about the assembly of different technologies into these very sophisticated aircraft. And he says, look, this thing over here that is in, intrinsic to how this airplane works has no history in the development of aircraft. It's brought from way out in this other technological space. So he uses a combinatorial view of technology change that essentially reflects the capacity of people to put things together that previously were not seen to have any obvious connection. And then this means there's going to be an increasing interdependence between innovations because of our ability to combine things. And we build on top not just of a single pillar, but across the whole structure of technology development uh, in a way that produces the overall rate of technology innovation. So basically, 
and I think this is, aside from this paper, this is an interesting point. Uh, technology growth is increasing. The world we're living in is changing faster and faster all the time because of our capacity to put more things together and as the base of innovations increases, we have more that we can put together so we're in an explosive and potentially frightening situation. So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to talk about innovation from a technological change perspective and whereas when we look at the simple individual innovation cycle analysis and produce some uh, centripetal forces, standardization as everyone adopts an iPhone or a smartphone or something like that, uh, if we look at innovations in the great mass, we see the situation is really much more tumultuous. Okay, so here I come to the theme of the conference. All this argument about technological change is purely in time, nothing about space. So let's put space in a culturally differentiated fat. So I'm moving towards my time here, uh, and I'll try and be compact. So when we do look at innovation in a spatial fashion, uh, I especially uh, rely on the issue of translation that you've written so much about, but many other dimensions to appropriation uh, in, in particular cultural spaces. And what that means is that rather than innovations being standardized, the appropriation process across cultures differentiates through changes in meaning the ideas that uh, originate and become globalized. So if people think globalization is a process of homogenizing new ideas, which you might think if you were looking in a narrow way at Roger's view, really what we're talking about is a globalization that increases the differentiation of ideas. The faster the world globalizes, the faster differences are created, assuming that we're uh, different uh, in one space to the next. That's just a very broad idea, yeah? but I want to at least signal an alternative view rather than I think the conventional one that, for example, US ideas are just prevailing everywhere. Okay, so I think that's the most of the work that I want to do on this. I really uh, could say more, but in, in the interest of time, let me move on to this topic. So one of the reasons that I'm interested in specialization and fragmentation is in terms of what it means for Pluralism. Pluralism uh, is, in a normative sense, pluralism in a normative sense is how we support diversity and difference in economic thinking. And many people who feel vulnerable in economics in terms of the approaches that they adopt find themselves by default arguing for pluralism. <laughs> so where, where do you recall that I was before this one interesting subject came up? I was trying to talk about pluralism as a normative orientation that we have on our field. Uh, that is, we're taking, we, we seek to make arguments in defense of pluralism. But I think one needs to talk about the grounds favoring pluralism from a descriptive pluralism point of view. That is, we want to say, what is the status of difference and diversity in our field? And you can see I'm making an argument for fragmentation. That's my descriptive pluralism. I'm trying to say, in fact, the center does not hold. The center is breaking up itself. This is why I was reluctant on the core periphery argument before. If economics, as produced at MIT or elsewhere, is no longer unified by an overarching theory, if specialization is producing fragmentation, then descriptively, I can say in a pluralist way, economics has tremendous diversity. So that's what my motivation is here. And uh, I want to characterize two approaches to disciplinarity. So interdisciplinarity, I think, comes out of the Chicago School. It comes out of standard trade theory. 
And what standard trade theory says is this country has these resources, this country has these resources, they're fixed, and that's the way we explain comparative advantage. And so when Lazier, as I was suggesting this morning, uh, argues when he defends e economics imperialism, when he argues for what economics comparative advantage is, he, well, supposes that economics has certain indisputable uh, characteristics. So that interdisciplinarity argument is really a way of talking about a relative autonomy between uh, different disciplines. And so they engage in this trade, which I also was trying to resist this morning. Now, let's talk about normative pluralism. If you accept this conception, then you could argue that just as disciplines operate fixed resources, fixed endowments, relatively independently, so should different approaches within economics. We could, that is, extend, if we're pluralists, defending, uh, say, heterodox approaches, or history of economics even, we could extend this argument. And I think this is what many people do in the heterodox community. They argue using this interdisciplinarity conception of disciplinarity. They use that, our approach too. We're, our approach should be important also. But this is uh, an argument that allows you to selectively defend an approach. So a neoclassical or mainstream game theorist, or however we might identify the mainstream, might say, game theory is not getting enough attention. It doesn't say anything about whether or not post-Keynesian economics should have any attention. It's a very potentially narrow and limited way to defend pluralism. So uh, you can promote uh, different approaches within economics selectively and only if it serves your own uh, interest. Multidisciplinarity. I think I like to think about disciplines as like complex systems or like ecosystems, highly interconnected. So this is a quite empirical claim. But I like to think that we like to think of social sciences if we think in inter interdisciplinary terms, like the New Political Economy Initiative in, this, in Portugal. I like to think of them as having so many interdependencies where we're overlapping and cross-cutting relationships that uh, you can't let any particular approach be destroyed. So biologists, when they talk about ecosystem uh, fragility, they say, don't take this little meaningless species out here by applying too much pesticide or whatever else might be damaging to that species because you never know how the whole ecosystem might be threatened. So this is a different grounds for normative pluralism. Diversity is intrinsically valuable to the function of the system. It's a different defense. Okay, so I think I'm just about finished here. I do some summary remarks. Uh, what I've tried to argue is that specialization is a long-term secular trend. I've tried to argue this. I don't know that the argument is correct, but I did my best to try to make the argument. Uh, a fundamental process, and then it's not just there's a process that works behind our backs. We have to know something about the behavioral story. So Heiner, he gives us this burden of knowledge argument and the rational response to it. And the sad story is that what Smith said ultimately applies to all the science workers and ourselves as well. I can only work in this narrow space if I'm to be published and survive. And all the breadth of human thinking is pushed away in the interest of professional survival. But let's be more optimistic or at least have a, a second view. Arthur's argument about technology change, the combinatorial view, says that we can bring ideas from many different uh, locations. We have this human capacity imagination, which is quite remarkable. And if you're looking for something that is unifying in my sad story of alienation and fragmentation, we might say that somehow, however obscure it may be, somehow this growth of what technology provides us, our capacity to innovate and use new ideas, this is something that we share. A, a very uh, 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 vulnerable fabric, perhaps, 
to how we might uh, function in a uh, world in which technology change is increasing, the rate is increasing, and it seems like historically we're not very good at managing technology change. So if indeed specialization is a fundamental process, we can't, I think, escape talking about pluralism. It's a fundamental project. It's not just a science project. It applies to the diversity of peoples and the diver diversity of types of behaviors that we all have. So I think if you think about human rights, you need to say, well, why do we want to protect difference? People have different needs, different experiences. Why do we want to protect that? I think it is a commitment that we're increasingly sharing, but is the basis for defending diversity and difference between us classic liberal thinking, freedom, my particular needs need to be protected because they're mine, the instrumental view, or do we need an ecosystem, complex system view of human society, which this uh, idea is I'm trying to suggest, where we favor intrinsically diversity. Thank you.